Hello, and we are live and almost on time. We had to catch the end of the Giants game. Congratulations so. to the Giants. Yeah, Bravo, gentlemen. Nice yeah. work. Nice beard. I'm jealous. So uh, welcome fun. to Google <laughs> Games Chat episode number six. I am Todd Kerpelman, your moderator and host and cat herder. The host with the most. To my left is Wolf Dobson, Dr. Wolf Dobson. Thank you. To my immediate right, we have Colt McCandless. And to his right, we have John McCutcheon. Hello. So, uh, how are you guys doing today? We, we are doing very Canadian today. All right. Yeah, yes. It's very Canadian now. It it's kind of Canadian. It's kind of. It is a little Canadian. It's yeah. a little Canadian. It's a little. It's kind of fallish weather. It's we good like caffeination weather. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's good yes. Seattle weather. Stay inside, play some video games, drink some caffeine. It's good weather. Watch I was show. listening to some maple leaf rag. No. There you go. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's Canadian, but <laughs> <laughs> it does have maple leaves in it. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's jump in. We're going to jump right into our first tech demo. I guess first and only tech demo because Wolf couldn't get his act together. Mm. Um, yes. And that's mm. going to be. I love you, man. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. He really couldn't. <laughs> he was drunk. <laughs> um, so we're going <laughs> to. He still is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> By the way, right. okay. we launched version 1.3 of the Hangouts API oh. this morning. <laughs> actually, all right, you know what? Wait, we're not going to jump into tech demo. <laughs> Tell me about what, what's in the, version 1.3. It, it's actually a very small update. It's, okay. uh, we, uh, <laughs> it just includes were, beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I if you are, uh, we renamed uh, one of the methods because to be more accurate, but the, the, uh, the fun thing that you can do is if you're working on effects, um, you can unmirror your uh, local uh, stream. So normally when you're like, especially if you're working with text effects, y you see it backwards because you're looking at yourself in a mirror. And so we made it so there's a, an API method to flip it back and forth. Um, and I assume with unmirroring, you'd finally have vampires able to see themselves in a uh, hangout. That's true, because the mirror rule doesn't apply to hangouts. They can finally <laughs> see themselves. Oh, that's interesting. If you have vampires and you put them in a hangout, do they see themselves because it's a camera, not actually a Wait, are we talking but about traditional vampires? But if you turn on video mirroring, do they disappear? Yes. Yeah, th so this is, we, we're in the a different state yes. now. We're in a different state now. The, the traditional vampire that bursts into flames in the sun mm -hmm. is no longer our standard quota for... Uh, society accepted vampire. Are you gonna right. say, are you talking about sparkly vampires? I, I'm not specifying anything. I'm just saying we have to update our persona. The internet didn't exist back when you know Van Helsing was around. Right? That's true. That's Mirrors right. were really the only way. There weren't like exactly. cameras. Yeah. There weren't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> so vampires upload themselves to YouTube and then look at themselves. <laughs> <laughs> they don't actually see themselves. That's the <laughs> only way. <laughs> they can. You know. Th we, you know. We really should save this discussion for 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 two weeks from now, or like That's in true. our Halloween episode uh, or something. Yeah. Um, but so does it does it actually unmirror the entire display or just the effects layer? Uh, no, it unmirrors it unmirrors the entire stream. So gotcha. You can, uh, you can see yourself. So you get that weird like experience of seeing yourself the way other people see you, which is and you like, go like, dude, totally is my unsettling. part on that side? Is well, yeah, and your eyes don't look like in the, the right position. Yeah, that's probably true for me all the time though. Yeah, I like how you complained about your hair. That's uh, that's it real. <laughs> that's cute. That's cute, <laughs> yeah. by the way. <laughs> yes. Anyhow, the there's a demo today, right? <laughs> <It's really cold. laughs> Well then, let's uh, stay on hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk more about hair. First world <laughs> hair problems. Yeah. All right, so yeah, let's move on to the demo. So right. John, John, John's going to show us a demo. Today. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to show an update to the NACL acceleration module. That if you happen to catch episode two or three, is it three? Or I think it was like three. Three. If you caught it live, which I never made it up to YouTube, you mm -hmm. would have seen a pre-recorded sample of this. But I'm going to show a live demo of this today. So. What we're looking at here is the bullet physics library is running in the background without any display, and I am communicating with it through JavaScript. So I have a JavaScript API to bullet, and I'm drawing and doing everything in JavaScript, which is pretty sweet. I can even grab a, a block and pick it up and move it around and smash over this Django pile. The picking of the objects is done in JavaScript, and the uh, actual physical simulation is, is done in C. Uh, it's ridiculously fast. Um, let me see if I can knock over this table. There we go. So the whole simulation is taking uh, right now about between one and two milliseconds to uh, simulate uh, over a hundred objects, which is just uh, it's amazing. But you get to write your application in JavaScript. I'm just using 3.js to do all the drawing. And hmm. 
that is very cool. I think we used this analogy last time, but it's like in the in the old days when the PC developers they would write sort of all their high level stuff in C, and then they would go into assembly for like mm -hmm. all of the you know really heavy lifting kinds of things. This is sort of that same idea taken up one level higher, yeah. where now you get yeah. to yeah exactly. So you, now you have your low level stuff, which in this case is a mix of C and assembly, mm -hmm. and you write all of your high level stuff in JavaScript. Uh, but this is a this demo is available in the Chrome Web Store, and there's actually a mode in it where you can describe the shapes and the initial state of the scene in a JSON file, and load it up in the application and watch it watch it play out. And what's really cool about this, what what I like about uh, seeing this demo is, you know, we we talk a lot, or, or rather, there's a lot of sort of tension in the web community right now about what language should be used on the web, right? You've kind of got different herds of people all kind of saying that A is Are right you and sheep? is that what you're saying? Uh, there's there's lots of different words. Um, so what happens is this is really one of the first times that we've come to the table and said like, hey, what happens when we actually hit the magic spot that it's not just one language, but we find out how to meld the right things of each language together, right? This is still using JavaScript to render and to manage the scene. But the high computational cost, the processing cost, is actually all being run in native client, right, in yep. C code. So we actually have the ability to have a conversation, I believe, which is that maybe one language isn't meant to rule them all. Maybe we can actually take from each language the best parts and, and use that to make a web a better place, especially um, when you get to see great stuff like this. Well, what, what about uh, debugging all of these things, though? I mean, that's the, whenever you, I mean, uh, I, I can remember Tails working in, working in Lua mm. uh, because you can <coughs> compile it and have it run on a, on a console, and then you discover you're sitting there like writing a Lua debugger <coughs> inside your regular C debugger. Well, so the nice thing is that Chrome ships with the JavaScript well, That debugger. is what I was, what yeah. I was well, this is the thing. Like, the reason why you write in JavaScript is because then you get Chrome's awesome debugger. <laughs> yeah, and you get the, the profiler and the, yeah, the memory get, profiler. You just get all uh, these things that you need that makes it easy to develop. Yeah. And then uh, the way that the acceleration modules are meant to work is they're somewhat off the shelf. It's essentially middleware. So you get a, a straightforward JavaScript API. Like in the JavaScript code, it's like add event listener scene update and call this JavaScript function. And it takes the transforms that Bullet computed and applies them to all the objects in the scene. Which is really cool, right? Especially when we get to a situation where we, you know, because everyone pretty much includes jQuery, right? It'd be great mm -hmm. if instead of including jQuery, we just start including physics modules. Yeah, right? that's exactly that what's add. happening here. Yeah. Pound include awesome. Yeah, which is really kind of nice for yeah. like sort of the future of, of the web. And when you think about web gaming and where this can take it, uh, you know, HTML5 offers this great ability to have very flexible gameplay, but again, may not give you some of the performance in the areas you need. And that's where these NACL acceleration modules fit right in. Very cool. So now, is is I, I don't know much about the bullet module besides that uh, the fact that we've been using it. Has that been written in house? Is that written external? Uh, so, from? Bullet fi is an open source physics library. Okay. Uh, you can find it on Google Code. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I wrote a, I wrote two things. One, I wrote a general purpose library that allows you to glue C to JavaScript mm -hmm. by uh, by way of post message. Okay. And then I wrote a Bullet uh, module for that, so that it implements a few function calls that you want to, you want to send from JavaScript into the C land like. I figure out what object is under the mouse cursor in JavaScript, and then I send over a message to C that says, OK, pick this object up now and start holding it. And then when I'm ready to drop it, I send a message to C that says, OK, drop this now. So what you're seeing is actually like a very tight coupling of uh, back and forth chatter between JavaScript and C, and it just it works really well. How that many? Cool. Uh, what was the limit on messages that you can send to the macro so, module? So uh, I did a, a bunch of uh, benchmarks, and I actually have a talk that's available uh, that came out today on GDL. Are you saying I didn't do my homework? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. We sent it around. You didn't you even share it on G plus, dude. Where's the Where's yeah. the game dev bro love? All right, <laughs> but quickly, you can send about four hundred megabytes per second of data round trip from JS to C, and the latency for small messages is about a hundred microseconds. So what this effectively means is with things like NACL acceleration modules, you can actually put a video decoder in native client and actually ship all the data over to JavaScript. Say, it, it, mm -hmm. it sounds like programming in the PS2, where you're like streaming your textures mm -hmm. in as you're, as you're playing, which is yep. neat, because you could actually construct the te textures out of, 
uh, like get user media or something right. like that, and then map them onto. The Especially think of it this way: with uh, all the accelerate, all the advances we've seen with uh, archive compression models like LZ Ham and Seven Zip and stuff like that, um, and with the adoption of compressed texture formats into WebGL, you can now actually store your stuff in hyper compressed data, mm -hmm. decompress it using native client in C++, and still stream it over to WebGL and use it there. So mm -hmm. really, really so exciting. Put stuff. that 400 megabytes per second into perspective. Like you can do. Um, 1024 by 1024, uh, 60 frames per second of like RGBA uh, frames, and only use 200 of it. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, it's an entire Final Fantasy game per <laughs> second. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So the great thing about the bullet is uh, the bullet acceleration module is that the actual output that you send every frame is 64 bytes per body being simulated. But the amount of memory being touched and the computation that's going on inside the sealand is massive, and then you just send over 64 bytes per body, hmm. and that's all you have to send over to the over to JavaScript. Yeah, this is good stuff. Uh, yeah. Check it out. Uh, it's on the Chrome Web Store. Definitely go take. Yeah, a look there's at. a talk, and I have a blog post, <laughs> and this application. <laughs> you can go and install this in the Chrome Web Store and make your own domino scene, and then just see it simulate. I hope people do that because, yeah. well, one, I love dominoes, but two, I love physics games. <laughs> yes. The more physics games that are out there, the better. Yeah. Jenga. So, uh, oh, Jenga, Jenga, Jenga. Just, just the stair dismount is my favorite. <laughs> just throwing the poor guy down the stairs endlessly. Yes. You just don't, you get, don't tired, get tired, tired of, of it. it. <laughs> this is the thing. Like, I'm just like, I just thought of that now, and I was like, oh, I got to go install that afterwards. <laughs> the, the two companies ago, I had this prototype for a game that I was working on that was nothing more than like shooting a guy out of a cannon. And just like you know, watching him hit Wasn't all these that random obstacles. for the PlayStation the Three. No, it was not. It uh, was, uh, this, was, this is a two D kind of thing. But that's essentially the same game, right? Like that, you just kind of set up your slingshot and you shoot the guy into the world, and you see how much damage you can do. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah they, more they, or less. Built into one of those racing games uh, where where they figured out they they made it so they had a ragdoll guy in mm -hmm. the car, and then when he crashed. The, they he would basically just inject him. You would just fought, and then they realized that was so much fun. They added this entire sub game where all you did was crash the car. And they had targets for the body, <laughs> <laughs> so you had to hit at the right angle at the right speed to launch the guy into the thing. There is, yeah, you, can, you can't ever really get tired of watching like ragdoll physics. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right, so uh, with cool. that, let's move into our uh, five for five topic. You know what right. we need is like we need a cool little graphic intro when we kind of talk about introducing this. Like <laughs> five for five. Yeah. Five for five. Can we? Can like we, can we ask our producer. Can we get on that? Jimmy. Jimmy. Jimmy says yes. He's going to build it for next time. Fantastic. So, uh, that would be great. <laughs> Perfect <laughs> time for the Halloween episode. Checks that you're Jimmy. <laughs> 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 All statements by Wolf Dobson are his own opinion and not that of any organization that may, he may be affiliated with at any time. All right. So uh, we've got five All topics. All my opinions are cold. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to talk for five minutes and 30 seconds because we need a little more time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when the timer buzzes... What are we buzzes, talking about? We'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Ready, right. go. <laughs> so here's the first question. Uh, there was an article on Kotaku, uh, I think last week, that basically argued that Quick saves have ruined tension in games. Mm. There's never any point where games are dead. Yeah, <laughs> games are dead, or at least tension in games are, are dead. Because like, <laughs> if you can quick save every few minutes or every few seconds or every couple of steps, that that tension is gone. Do we agree? Do we think that uh, we need to remove quick saves to bring tension back into games? You know what we should do? It should punch you in the stomach every time <laughs> yeah. you die in a game. <laughs> That's what we should do to people. No, I, I think I think for me, it's all about like, does this game respect my time? You know that mm -hmm. that uh, yeah, I gave up on uh, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas near the end because they had a mission where you sat through a long cutscene, then you parachuted down to a place, hmm. then you had to kill all the guys on the unskippable thing where you had to kill all the guys on the helipad, then you had to go from the helipad down a thing, and then, and then finally you get to the the car racing part. The car racing part was like really slow, clumsy, with like, you know, tires made out of petroleum jelly. So you're like skidding all over the place trying to chase this guy. Each try took like 11 minutes. Yeah. And the point, the problem with that is that I wasn't getting better at driving while I was practicing that whole sequence. Mm -hmm. I was doing the thing that I had already mastered, which is clearing the house uh, full of guys, machine guns, and parachuting, which wasn't very hard. And the part that I needed practice on 
I was was the part that I couldn't uh, yeah. the part that I couldn't practice, um, and instead had to pay eleven minutes every time I want to see it, and that was like the end of the game for me. When you look at a game like V V V V V V V, um, it's brutally hard, but uh, it lets you keep practicing the part that you need to practice over and over and over again. And meet Super Meat Boy and things like that. Yeah. Those games are incredibly tense. They're just um, they're only they're letting you focus on the parts that are important. Yeah. Well, I've I've got to bring up Dark Souls and Demon Souls, which uh, <laughs> are exactly <laughs> what you described, and I think that's why a lot of people love them. Uh, that's certainly why I was really attracted. Well, what to What those skill games. are you practicing when you're practicing when you're playing Dark Souls? Like, what, what what are you mastering when you're mastering? You're Dark mastering Souls? the combat system. You're but, but you're not mastering a like a like a, a physical thing. You're mastering the sort of no, long term little... economics of managing your party. Mm, well, there's no party in the game. Well, it's well whatever. Just, uh, yeah, it's. I think what you're mastering uh, one is the combat. So when you're, it's a little bit more like fencing, though. So it's a little bit more like, okay, I'm just going to get like one hit in, and then I'm going to like back off and be patient for a beat or two, and then come back in for it again. Um, but what makes that game so interesting is that death matters, and it's funny that we're talking about quick saving because Dark Souls always saves. It's saving constantly. Every minute, the game saves and you can't go back to a previous version of the save, but it's always being written. So there's been a couple times where I made a really bad mistake and I actually like ran across the room and unplugged the PS3 <laughs> <laughs> so that it wouldn't write to the save file. <laughs> that's wow. a, that's a so this is like the other way of quick save. Forced <laughs> quick saves adds a lot of tension. This is like when I used to like hack games and like change bits inside it so they would get easier. <laughs> it's like what I'm actually learning is how to hack it <laughs> games and not. Yeah. I mean that's that's a ba that's basically saying sort of. Like but no quick saves. Or but, but well, it's I always mean, it's, saves. It's, it's See, like Iron Man mode in uh, the new XCOM game, where mm -hmm. yeah, there's just sort of it's quick saving without sort of reloading. Yes. Yeah, I still yeah. think this comes down to what you're mastering, though, because when you're playing Dark Souls, what you're doing is getting good at managing this long, uh, this yeah. long sequence of actions yes. that you have to yeah. do. But that's well, exactly what's going on with uh, GTA, right? Like it is like to get from one point, kind of checkpoint in Dark Souls to the next. It's this long sequence of different action moments. But, but are they really? Are they are they are they completely orthogonal to each other, or are they all related? So that if you got good at the first half, you be better at the second half. It's all combat. So um, so it's all the same skill that you're practicing. I mean, they're yeah, different yeah, different guys, yeah. but you're still you're ultimately you know getting yes. your your pattern. You are, down. You are mastering and your so th character. This is my complaint about the GTA abilities. moment was that you aren't mastering yes. the. I, mean, I, you're, I you're completely. You, you just needed checkpoints after the parachuting part, after the clearing out well, the guys uh, part. I, so I, I, I want could. the I want the thing that I'm practicing to be the thing that I'm that that, that I'm trying to overcome, not. Um, I I've had that same experience in games where there's a sequence of five totally separate moments. Mm -hmm. And I can do four of them, and the fifth one I just f suck at, mm -hmm. and you just do it again and again. And yeah, again. And, you, and, you, and there's no way to isolate that and, and like you know practice yeah. that that muscle until you've got it just right. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, and I mean, I think that article comes down to yeah, terribly implemented save systems are really frustrating, and <laughs> or terribly designed save systems are frustrating. So our users have some good feedback. Oh. Two pieces. One person says Jimmy? they hated it in Quake that if you did a quick save at the wrong time, you'd forever reload and die. Yes, <laughs> yes. 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 Again, yes. poorly implemented save. Someone else says quick save was practically a must have feature in the 90s, and if you didn't have it, you were screwed. See, so now I'm going to agree with this. So here's my thought is that quick save has nothing to do with the tension of a game. By the way, sorry. Thank you, audience, yeah. for contributing. That's awesome. Yes. Thank you. Yay! Thank you. Um, so, like, Half-Life 2, you uh -huh. could quick save wherever you want. But that mm -hmm. was still a really tense game. Oh, my game, gosh. Right? Yeah. And yeah. to go back to your point, like, yes, you, you are trying to master something, but it allowed you to say, I will master X at a specific Y time. Right? So, really, the only time it removes tension is if you're someone who's obviously manipulating that to an extreme. And that person's probably not caring about tension of the environment anyway. They're trying to optimize, they're trying to min-max the system. Hmm. I got the last word in. Yeah, you got the last yeah. word in. I actually that's think good. that's yeah. probably a good point to, to move on to our next question. Isn't Design it? good save points. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I totally you. agree. Like, uh, the Half-Life 2 was a very tense game for me, even with quick saves. Yeah. Well, uh, you, the, the thing about right, it is... You didn't, you didn't abuse it. Or yeah. Well, well, I, no, well, I the general thing is, I the general would, thing is hyperbolic statements like quick save, do X. I, I think that's wrong. I think you have to take a look at the user and how the user is experiencing yeah. your content. If the user is going to manipulate something, that's how they're trying to experience your content, right? We all can agree that the original EverQuest 
resulted in horrible death penalties, right? When you got to level 42 and you died, you lost a half a bar of experience, which took you two days to get back, right? One of the successful things that modern MMOs do to combat that is when you die, you don't lose experience, right? You can kind of see that as a quick save, but there's still tension, there's still something on the line. Well, you're still frustrated when you lose, and, there's st right. and, and you, you, you're knocked out of the raid, which is a bad enough penalty. They don't need to also lop off three days of effort. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. been, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just saying that hyperbolic statements like, like what was made in the article are, are trying to address the are wrong Are they part. trying to get clicks? Yeah, I was oh. just, the word link bait was going off in my head. <laughs> <laughs> that never happened. We totally no. fell for it. Um, it they got they got Todd's four like, extra Aw. clicks. Then. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so HTML5. Uh, I feel like for for a long time, mm. you know, game developers are saying this is this is going to be the future of web HTML5 games. It's going to be the, the future. future. It's the future. Um, I feel like we're you know from a few years ago, we're now in the future, <laughs> and it's still kind of <laughs> off in in the future. Where are the flying cars? Uh, <laughs> Where are the robot? Right. Butlers? We got What's you know going we're going getting on? close to the self driving cars. I don't yeah. know about the flying ones. But I still feel like you know if I look at the most popular games on the web, if I look if I go to Congregate and see what's sort of driving a lot of the the online games right now, you know it's still primarily Flash, some Unity. Mm. I mean, you know HTML5 is there, yeah. but it hasn't become sort of the the dominant um, force yet in games in the browser. Why not? <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm asking. That's you. That's fine. That's fine. So I, I think I think uh, you bring up a very good point about sort of where is the evolution of HTML5, and I, mm -hmm. I want to approach this from a long view perspective first. So uh, first off, when, when HTML5 was first sort of announced and, and what it was doing and what it was capable of, you have to remember that the browser share that actually supported HTML5 was actually pretty low, right? And game developers at that time were very much concerned about reach. I mean, we're talking mm -hmm. about late 2008, early 2009, when the big thing to do was to write sort of a Flash game and put it on a social network, right? So you were more concerned with daily active users clicking your pink cow than you were anything else, right? So fast forward to 2012. We've now got the dominant share of users can run HTML5 games. The problem now is that the focus is in a different medium, right? The focus is in mobile and what mobile is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a great thing for uh, Google I.O. this year. We actually took some game developers or some ex-game developers who work at Google and we made a game. We said, let's figure out if this HTML5 thing is actually worth the hype. And we made a game called Grits, which is a, a top-down 2D shooter. And you could actually uh, just Google for my name and the word Grits and you'll find everything. But we, we actually took a look at it and said, we're ex-game developers, let's approach HTML5 and figure out if it's hype or if it's not. And what we found was this, was that People approaching HTML5 development uh, have, have two skewed views. Number one, they think it's in a vacuum. They believe that HTML5 development is its own little island and no one's ever made games before. Like the people we talked to were completely oblivious to, to very good tools like Texture Packer or Tiled, right? These are, these are staples of 2D game development that people in the HTML5 world or even the web world just didn't know. Right? They're coming from the world where they're expecting this IDE that Flash has and expecting something to migrate over. Uh, so that, that was first an issue, and sort of educating people that, hey, listen, it's all data. Right? If you export a 3D model from Maya, you can load it in WebGL. It's just yeah. data. Um, the second problem was that developers were sort of a, approaching the, the HTML5 concept from, from a very different viewpoint, which was that they, they thought it should all be integrated and all solve every problem everywhere at every time, which kind of is due to the hyperbolic nature of the statements. But what we really found is that HTML5 is a web language. It was designed for the internet. Believe it or not, it wasn't actually designed for games, right? What we've been able to do is because HTML5 is so powerful, we've been able to do gaming experiences. Well, this kind of comes to the tier of like what the, the demo John showed and everything, which is that HTML5 is great for a tier of experiences. When you want to move beyond that tier, you're going to quickly run into problems. And in my talk, I, I talk about that. I won't go into it today. But when you hit that tier, you're going to say, hey, you know what? There's a certain things that, that we just cannot do. It's like dealing with limited hardware, right? You're not going to be able to render 2.4 million polygons on your mobile device today. Right? It just doesn't work. So it's a tier of applications. Once you hit that point, you've got to move forward. So uh, I believe that the future of HTML5 is very bright. I'm, I'm very encouraged about it. But I think... The problem has been messaging to this point. It's been very hyperbolic. It hasn't very been very pragmatic about what game developers should be actually be doing. So I, have I monopolized the whole five minutes yet? Not yet. Well, I, I was going to say that you know I, I, I came from a background first of console mm -hmm. uh, console game development and then Flash, and when I started writing HTML5 games, I uh, a little bit what you're talking about. I felt like I 
a little bit of like, oh, and you know, this is a couple of years ago, I felt like a little bit lobotomized, like, oh, I don't have all of these really comfy tools that mm-hmm. I'm used to. Um, now, uh, now I feel a lot more like it's like Lisp, like where I fire up the yeah. game, I open the console, and I start typing stuff in the console. Like I'm developing much more like I developed in grad school when I was working on AI right. than, uh, than, I, than I was as a console developer. Because you know, back when I was working, even uh, on the Dreamcast and, and the Wii, you know, you like fire up uh, a run, and then you go. I used to draw on my whiteboard a lot because yeah. I'd wait the two and a half minutes for it to start, <laughs> and then yeah. I'd be able to play it. And with HTML5, I can sit there and write code in the in the command line as I'm going along, and that's faster right. <laughs> than using the IDEs because I have such an interactive experience when I'm coding. And I think that's that's. A mode of coding that people who come from C backgrounds aren't as aren't as familiar with, mm. and and so I will point this out too is uh, probably one of the most important things I think about that Chrome has done uh, in in being open source is the auto update feature, right? Mm-hmm. Again, when we talk about who has HTML5 support in their browser, again it was very limited early on. Now Chrome's got a fantastic user base. A lot of the other browser vendors have realized that the auto update feature allows you to kind of keep on the cutting edge, and a lot of them have announced support for auto update, which means that we're going to have more HTML5 support in the user or in the future, and that means that users are all going to have HTML5 support. So now it's a better time than ever to actually come to the table and write an HTML5 game that gets good reach and has good performance. Now again, here's the here's the pragmatic statement. You're still writing on fragmented hardware, right? If you're coming out and you're actually writing a WebGL game, your shader may not run on every device, right? So again, it's sort of where the web meets hardware, and we're seeing that a lot again with these with these mobile devices, where you've got uh, you know technology that's supposed to be uh, homogeneous, but hardware that's heterogeneous, and we need to kind of come to the table and say, hey, game developers have been dealing with this for a long time. This is nothing new. It's mm-hmm. just a new language and a new ecosystem. So. I also think that uh, Chrome on Android. Um, is a big step forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, like, uh, you know, making an HTML5 game and then trying to run it really slowly on, you know, 2009, you know, mobile browsers was like, oh, this yeah. is terrible. Now we get hardware acceleration. Now we get all of these things that you want. Um, and like a really great Java com- JavaScript compiler and all the rest, uh, or runtime. You know, this is, these are the tools that I needed. Right. Uh, I need. I need. I have. I have. Now. You have today. Go use them. So I'm a I'm a Flash developer, I'm a, I'm a theoretical Flash developer, and I'm saying <laughs> you're right. theoretical Flash developer. <laughs> right. So right, so wait, th- there's so many ways to parse that. Are you <laughs> theoretical right. in the sense that you don't actually <laughs> exist? Let's suppose I'm a Where's Flash the comma? developer. Oh oh, and I see. I'm you're saying, not. You're doing <laughs> all right, you know, I'm gonna get into I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get into you know making a game HTML5. Got it. What do I need to know? So my tools are different. I Your need to actually go out and look for. I, I can't expect all of them to be available in my IDE, but I do. Um, but there are some good ones out there that I should be looking for. Yep, yep. So, so first off, I think you should start mm-hmm. at the fact that uh, even Adobe has started adopting HTML5, yep. right? I think the newer uh, IDEs they have actually have either HTML5 Ex- support, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and if they, if you don't want to opt in for that that tier of support, there, there's also mm-hmm. great HTML5 packages out there, like Easel JS is a oh, fantastic I love one Easel. that'll actually I, take Flash over to JavaScript on your behalf. Um, when you get to that sort of scenario, though, if you realize that you don't want to use the Flash IDE for your primary editing environment, then yeah, you need to go back and you need to look at how we've been making video games for the past 30 years, right? I mean, how many games are actually built on mobile today? What tools are they using? A lot of them are 2D. Maybe you should you know, research that data, look for it. I'll tell you, the two main ones are Tiled for creating world uh, maps and everything, and the other one is Texture Packer. Uh, texture Packer is fantastic. It'll create atlases. It'll minimize your footprint. It'll uh, increase your speed. It's it's a great thing. All right. So those two tools and get start loving the idea that you can code yeah, while everything's yeah. running. And yes. Sort of well, awesome. Yeah. There was a really um, interesting demo that someone's put together of that type of programming working with C and C plus plus. It's called Juice J U C E. Mm-hmm. And uh, I watched a YouTube video of it. It is very impressive stuff. I mean, yeah. like. You can, uh, the demo is presenting like a, a UI with a button and, and things like that, and they actually clicked in the running application, made the button bigger, and you saw the source code change. Mm. And it's all using LLVM and Clang, and yeah. it's. Now, it's what, I'll, what I'll say about this, and I know we're over time, but I think this is an important point about web technologies, is uh, we're actually starting to see a lot of people realizing what can be done in a browser and trying to bridge it, because we have a lot of developers coming to the table, especially from the traditional industry, who have 
a C++ code base with 10 million lines of code. Right? For them to migrate into the web, that may not be easy if they're trying to take everything to JavaScript. So we've seen some good stuff come forward, like the LLVM compilers that'll take C++ and convert it to JavaScript. Uh, we've been seeing native client making some good uh, headway. We've been seeing Dart doing great stuff, too. Um, I, I think the important thing, again, is to come back and say, you know, let's talk about user experience, let's talk about data, and let's talk about where the future of the web is. Now that we can actually get the, the tip of the iceberg, we're seeing the performance start, we're seeing the user experiences come through. You know, where, do, where does that lead us? Okay. All right, moving on to a, uh, this is a question that has absolutely nothing to do with games, but uh, yes. I thought I'd ask it anyway. Yes. Which is, uh, speaking as a parent. Speaking yeah. as a parent. So we uh, derail this conversation right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I am. I am. I got two kids. Uh, mm. You know, I'm going to assume. Well, I'm. I'm assuming that you know, in 15 to 18 years, <laughs> theoretical children. Yep, I've got my theoretical. They're theoretical children. flash. I children. actually have 37 <laughs> theoretical children. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. so a lot of theoretical I'm, work. <laughs> I, I am putting money away every paycheck um, to to a college fund based on the idea that you know. I, at some point in the future, I'm going to need to spend an awful lot of money mm. to you know send these kids to college. At the same time, I'm spending like my morning bus ride, like reading, you know, watching Stanford classes on my mm -hmm. computer. And I'm like, hey, wait, I'm getting this for free. I don't need to pay a quarter of a million Why dollars buy or whatever. The cow? <laughs> you can get the so milk. yeah, uh, so th th this is my question: is like, is the idea of saving for college, you know, is this is this kind of weird and old fashioned? Uh, are you and looking in, for in an excuse to blow your? Kids I'm looking for an excuse <laughs> to take my kids' <laughs> college fund. And Hawaii. go to Hawaii for, for, for a year. No. So is this, can I justify this? Um, I think, so weirdly, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so there's, there's lots of, there's some data on this. And okay. there's also some, uh, and uh, sadly I'm not going to be able to footnote it because I just read some stuff on the web once and it seemed really convincing. No. It seemed <laughs> like a totally legit um, site. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems legit, uh, bro. <laughs> it was theoretical, theoretical uh, footnotes. The um, no, uh, there's some data on this, and there's also th there's there's interesting th there's interesting things where it's like we have all these tools available. Like I can give you, you know, you can go buy a laptop for you know three hundred dollars, and you're mm -hmm. connected to the web, and you can do all these amazing things. You can watch these Stanford Coursera, classes. I can go to, yeah, you can do all these things, and I think those are going to be really powerful for certain kinds of applications. There's very little evidence that when you cut people loose with like a calculus textbook and uh, uh, and you know some video recordings of calculus that they come out learning calculus on the other side. Like programming is a different thing because it's such an interactive. Uh, you know, like like online programming courses make tons of sense to me because it's like, yeah, I mean, uh, it, this is how we all learned how to program. Is sort of keep fiddling with it until it works. Calculus doesn't lend itself th to that very much. Um, uh, it's not that you can't. It's just it happens very rarely as compared to people teaching themselves to programming, uh, to program. So some of that is programming is a kind of thing that is easy to teach yourself, and uh, you know calculus or sociology possibly not. <laughs> um, the other thing has to do. With, I mean, there's lots of educational theory on this. Like when you're in a room with a bunch of people who are all trying to do calculus, you're all helping each other and you're all focusing each other on the same thing. Hangouts. Uh, this is the thing, uh, you know. <laughs> a year ago, I don't. I don't think he was going that direction, yeah. but I think he just made him go that direction. Yeah. Um, well, uh, and there's actually a term for it. It's called the zone of proximal development. Like when we're all in a room together, we we create a zone. It's actually a very confusing paper in Polish, but it's. Been, I think it's Polish. Zagoski is the guy. Seems, anyway, seems legit. Uh, <laughs> that I actually can't find. Out. The zone of proximal development is a, is a th real educational theory. Seems legit. But it is. It, it really is like when people get in a room together, they teach each other stuff. And gaming is like this too. Mm -hmm. Like uh, when you're sitting there trying to figure out how to optimize your whatever, uh, your your um, uh, Street Fighter uh, combos. It really helps to have somebody else in the room with you, and you're all thinking about it at the same time. No, give me the control. Let me try it. No, give me the control. Let me try it. Like this kind of stuff. So I think to the degree that we can create online communities that that create the zone, so to speak, uh, that's going to be an interesting. Uh, that'll be an interesting torque on this. But um, the other thing is the, the there was the study that came out recently that was saying that if you, the money that you spend on college, if you if you're taking out loans the amount of money that you make, uh, the extra money that you make for having a college degree does not necessarily pay back the loans, if you, depending on the size of the loans that you take. Like if you borrow completely to get your college education. But if your parents are paying for it, it's an awesome deal. Oh, 
crap. Uh -oh. <laughs> and part of that is because you're not paying, you're, the interest is very different. But yeah. that, that's kind of a, uh, like, that's more economics theory than game theory. <laughs> what do you think, um, John? Uh, I think you moved to Canada. <laughs> I was about to say, you're, you're Canadian. What yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or any, other, any other country where uh, higher education is not something that is, like, equivalent to buying a house. Uh, and then your child's education fund can be very small, relatively speaking, and uh, it'll be all right. Mm. I mean, uh, by the time I was done grad school, I had made money. Wow, I cannot say that about. Yeah. No. Yeah. You <laughs> get once you get into the. I mean, you know, you start get you start to get paid to do research. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call. I wouldn't call the stipend I was getting in grad school. Well, we called it so a pittance. <laughs> sure, it, and, and it was, but it offset the four years of undergrad huh. for me as uh, a Canadian. Not for me, yeah. but I went to private school, so it was great. Uh, we don't really have that. So, <laughs> so uh, we, we, do we, ha we have three so comments not, from the Not from as the a parent. And so, Todd, we have another question, which is on topic. Oh, a question the on question topic. The question is, and this goes to anyone, what okay. three frameworks would you recommend? Now, free, not three. Uh, frameworks for HTML5 development. Sure. Um, uh, Easel, Easel JS. It's yes. part of the. I think it's Creative JS. Yes. It's got Tween JS. It's got all this stuff. Yeah. If if you know a little Flash or even a lot of Flash, you'll feel very much at home in Easel. Yep. It, it it's not quite Flash because uh, containers can't also be uh, uh, rendered objects, but it is a retain mode uh, 2D uh, Z sorted uh, graphic system. So you'll you'll get going really fast if you use uh, uh, use Easel. Um, I highly recommend uh, checking out Impact JS. Uh, I had never written a, a JavaScript application before, and I started with Impact JS, and it taught me a lot about the language and about how to manipulate the language and create object inher inheritance. And plus, it's got a built-in level editor inside of it. So I highly recommend uh, hmm. starting there. Yeah. All right. I'm going to say skip JS and head straight to Dart. Ah. Oh, look at you. Are there, are there, well, you've, are got, there you've got a free Are there tools? Are there, right? are there game making tools? There's no game making tools yet, <laughs> uh, but there's quite a few libraries, uh, a few of which I've written, and there's some other people who are really interested in Dart for games, and there's mm -hmm. uh, a bit of a community going. There's a Dart game dev list uh, that you can, or Google group discussion list that you can join. Yeah. Dart's really exciting for games. Uh, it's really cool uh, stuff. Uh, one of yeah. the things that's great about programming in Flash is that you have like object types and things like yes. this. Object yeah. inheritance. The type system, system. imagine. Yeah. yeah. Strongly, or optionally strongly typed uh, functions. I, I love the yeah. concept of optionally strongly typed. Kind of forget about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's yeah. Optionally yeah. strong. It's yeah. like <laughs> theoretically Flash. As, yeah, as not just a theoretical <laughs> Flash developer, as a former Flash developer, I really like Dart because I was like, oh, this feels very comfortable. And yes. It's got... Yeah. I was looking at a comparison of Dart syntax to ActionScript, which I, I know nothing about ActionScript, but I was kind of like, after looking at side by side for all of the language construct, I'm like, ah, I know ActionScript. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's I've got it's it. It's like, a f yeah, it's kind of, I yeah. feel like it, Dart is kind of the best parts of both languages. Like, it's kind of parts of many languages. Th there, yeah. there are some beautifully crazy things you can do in JavaScript that you can't do in ActionScript, but. So, uh, I, I want to say this real quick, too. Uh, be the funny thing is, we're all talking about language here, and mm -hmm. the thing I was trying to get at at the beginning is that we should do everything we can to try to make sure that language isn't the barrier. And so if you're one of the developers out there who also feel this way, I highly recommend checking out a new language called Hacks, H-A-X-E. The interesting thing about Hacks is it's sort of designed as this meta-level language that you program in it, and it actually creates output code that is JavaScript or C++ or ActionScript mm -hmm. or Dart. Mm -hmm. So the really interesting thing is when you talk about investment over time as a developer, as a programmer, you care about how you're building your libraries. And if you develop it with hacks, you're kind of future-proofing how you're moving forward because at bare minimum, you can do a source-to-source -source translation from hacks to C++ and then move the direction you need to. Again, not perfect, I'm but... Still, uh, I'm still going to harp on debugging, though. Like, is well, it easy to yeah, debug hacks? Yeah. Uh, so, so I make no statements about that, just as a option that they do have support with uh, Flash Develop, and it is out there, and it is open source, and it is free. I mean, Definitely most, most debuggers have some concept of a source map, right? Mm -hmm. like Chrome's debugger has it. GDB, if you emit the correct dwarf data into your elf, <laughs> will be able to... <laughs> what are you emitting into an elf? That's, that's the topic of our next show, dwarf. emitting dwarfs into elves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, sadly, I know what you're talking about. Um, yes. The, yeah. <laughs> I spent a long time managing my elf. 
Did we have another yeah, question yeah. on HTML5? Uh, no, uh, dev? One, one last one last thing. Uh, 3JS. Um, mm -hmm. If you're looking for a retain mode 3D option, mm -hmm. 3JS is pretty cool. Is there is there uh, something more um, uh, sort of uh, has a like a bigger like pipeline than 3JS? Like 3JS is great because it is this retain mode thing, but it's like you know from Maya to uh, something to uh, rendering framework. It not not that I've really found besides the flash route. Uh, a lot of people really haven't embraced 3D on the web. I think 3JS is really the only example of it. And again, web developers typically don't approach things from the concept of it's just data, right? Traditional game developers, console game developers, PDC game developers, they just view it as a bunch of bytes that they transform and they move around. And so the pipeline is sort of secondary to them. You know, the mm -hmm. data gets into memory. Yeah, but if you if you're really making big big games, you have to need you, you need to get all the data from uh, you know, somebody makes Maya, there's a pipeline, it gets checked in, it gets yeah, so version <coughs> in, your in your source control. My favorite answer to this question uh, is this library called AssImp, the Asset Importer Library. Mm. And this will take... They need a better uh, name. It's an awesome <laughs> name. It's, it's such a good library, too. <laughs> it, it will take any model format, including animation, mm -hmm. and put it into, uh, load it into well-defined, well-structured C data structures. And I use this library to generate all of the assets for all, both of my engines, and I just have a different exporter. But the nice thing is it will load anything that you throw at it, and then you can just extract the vertices and the indices, and you know it'll do post-processing where it'll like clean up the mesh or like regenerate normals, generate tangents. Mm. It's so if you're if you're looking to do 3D on the web, definitely check out AssAmp. Yeah. Definitely you know look at 3JS for definitely what it does. It's not a off the shelf solution, but it'll allow you to yeah. write an exporter. You know what? That most of game development is smoke, mirrors, duct tape, and bubble gum. So, so you true. Know what, that's yeah. that's completely fine. Uh, also, yeah. it, Mr. Dube, <laughs> he's the. Uh, 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 he wrote 3JS. Yeah, he wrote 3JS, yeah. and he's. Uh, He's on Google Plus. You can follow him. Follow him. Cool. So speaking of Google Plus, question for you, Wolf, from the crowd. This is from Tidefox76. He says, what do you think of the integration of Google Apps, including Google Plus, into multiplayer browser games with group player interaction? I'm interested in this myself. MMORTS. MMORTS. Whoa, wait. First off, MMORTS. You're you're swinging big, player. Ah. Well, that is a big question. I think, you know, obviously I'm a big fan of Hangouts. Uh, <laughs> you don't say. Yeah, it's yeah. true. Hangouts. It's, it's true. Hangouts, um, I've never heard of them. Yeah, they're neat. You should try them sometime. Oh, tell me more. Now? <laughs> no. If I call now, do I also get the blender? <laughs> no, blender is a different, that's a 3D that's package. A, that is yes, a 3D exactly. model package, also free and open source. Um, yeah, blender. Um, the, the, there's a lot, that's an interesting question. Um, it's something that I'm interested in. I know with Hangouts, uh, you can, uh, with Google Plus, obviously, one of the things that it seems small, but it's kind of big, which is that you can actually use uh, uh, sign in with Google um, to uh, authenticate people, which means that you aren't inventing another, <laughs> another login form yeah. for your game site, which is awesome. Um, let me see here. What else can you do? Uh, this is just Google Plus in particular. Um, Hangouts, obviously, you can embed your entire game inside Hangouts, assuming that it it's, uh, runs uh, in a web page someplace, which means that everyone can see it. Even if, you not, e even if you're not uh, running the game inside a Hangout, you can actually use screen share from Hangouts to share uh, your, your window, your mm -hmm. browser window or whatever, and actually show, you know, like, look, this is what I'm seeing right now. You know, there, there's some uh, lag there, but it's still a great way. And in fact, when we played uh, like Warlight, which uh, in uh, in Hangouts, sometimes if people are having trouble understanding the game, I just screen share my map and be like, "See what I'm doing is I'm clicking here and I'm attacking these guys, and I have these guys here." It's actually an, it's it's an amazing tool. And if you think back to the conversations that you used to have with people on uh, like when you're playing. Age of Empires or, or StarCraft 2 and you're like, look at what I see! Look at what I see! And you can't because you're <laughs> separated by 200 miles and you're trying to like, no, over to the no, uh, next to the thing! There's actually, a, when, when I was playing uh, a long time ago when I worked at Silicon Graphics and Doom came out, uh, I remember sitting back to back with somebody when we were playing uh, co-op Doom and I was like, hey, you gotta come look at the map. And he was like, okay. And there's this long pause. I'm like, dude, look at the map. And he's like, what? And I, I 
you know, I'm looking at the map on my screen, and I take the map down, and I see his character running around me. And he's like, so is there a key I pressed or something? Like, no. And I reach to his chair and I pull it around. And he's like, oh, I didn't think of that. But, you know, with Hangouts, you can actually do it. You can actually do this, this share moment. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's very interesting. Mm. You know what I want? When I start a raid in an MMO, I want that to post to, like, my guild people's yes. circle, post something to my stream that says, Todd is in a raid, why don't you join him? Click like, the I'll link, click a button, you go need to a, the game. If, if you were in a hangout, you can certainly name your hangout ha Raid Hangout, and then it will appear in, in your stream as Raid Hangout. You better join me. Yeah. And then you can turn on your yeah, screen share. Yeah, I've actually yeah, never yeah. tried screen sharing like a raid. That would be, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how that would work or yeah. if that would work. Somebody try that and get that homework for the audience. Yes, homework. Um, Exercise. I'll start a ten-person, ten-person raid. Do it in a hangout. See what happens. Booyah! Can you? Um, yeah. All right. <laughs> um, do we have time? We got time. Let's do. We got time for one more question, and uh, I'm going to stop our. What about uh, what we're playing? All right, that's good. That'll that'll be a good last question. All right. And we don't even need the timer for that because. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's always. Fun. Jimmy will just. Jimmy will he'll kind of do the fade out music or yeah. whatever. We'll save these other questions for next time. <laughs> John, what are you playing? FTL, uh, Faster Than Light, which is an awesome rogue like like, as the creators like to put it. So it's a, it's somewhat I guess like Firefly, where you are a random kind of gang of criminals on a ship, and so it's like my real life. Thing. Yeah, it's a typical day. <laughs> you. It starts off and it says you're carrying some really important documents and the rebels are after you. And you have to leap uh, using your FTL engine from like planet to planet uh, from left to right on this map. And every time you leap, some uh, text-based adventure happens where it says, okay, you've, uh, you know, like one time I met a cult and it's like, do you want to look into the eye? And I'm like, sure. And then boom, one of my characters is gone just disappears and that's it um, and then you leap to the next planet and there's a rebel f ship there and you have to fight them and that's when it becomes almost exactly like an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation because you're managing your crew mm -hmm. by clicking on them and telling them like okay you go to the engine room and you repair the engine you go to the shields place and you repair the shields like you stay here and you start like charging up your weapons bringing your shields up and you have to manage your power levels and like reroute power to the subsystem that needs it the most, and you're taking out the enemies, and they can you can even eventually buy a teleporter where you can teleport from your ship to the enemy ship and then fight hand to hand. Hmm. But you have to be careful not to blow up the enemy ship while your guys are on it. <laughs> because that death actually matters in this game. I feel like no quick save. Star, Star Trek three <laughs> here. There, what is there's the, no what saves. is the computer's voice saying? Three, two, <laughs> get off it, get yeah, off the ship. Yeah. It's a lot of fun, and so now wasn't this a? Am, am I correct in that this was a Kickstarter project? I originally? think it was. Actually. Well, they, they were building. I, I, if I recall correctly, they were building it for a while, and then they kickstarted to get to the end of the project. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And where do you get the game now? FTLgame.com. Right. I mean, is it? I guess. I did it on Steam. It's on Steam. Steam. It's on Steam. And <laughs> you can Google it. And you'll find it. Awesome. Google it. Huh? Really? <laughs> what is this thing? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm playing a great game uh, called Arcane Legends. Uh, the guys over at Space Time Studios actually hooked me up with a secret code to let me get a preview of the game, and mm. I've been playing it all week, and, and it's fantastic. It's a great MMO that runs on your phone <coughs> as well as in the browser running with native client, and so it's really cool to be able to actually like pick up my phone, play the game, and then sit at my desk and play the game too, you know, and be able to play against the guy next to me who's on his device. So really cool. They got a great uh, visual art look, great new dynamic with the game. The monetization is, it, it really feels paced instead of like, like most microtransaction stuff, you feel like things are removed from you that keep you from having a good time. No, this game's got it right, man. I'm <laughs> all, all that's removed for you in this game is your money. Is yeah, that what you're yeah. yeah, pretty much. Like, I, I'm a super fan of this game. I think it's fantastic. I cannot wait for it to launch. Uh, so, so Space Time Studios, it, you guys got to hit that. I saw the trailer. Cute puppy. Yeah, really nice. yeah, yeah. The pet mechanic is really cool, actually. Okay. Um, it's kind of it kind of walks that line between like a uh, torchlight and uh, a pet for like an MMO, right? Mm. So the 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 mad loot drops as you're playing the game, and your pet will run around and kind of pick it up for you. But it also doubles as a um, like a, a tank or you know it'll actually fight with you and but won't split your XP which is really cool That's nice. so uh, it's kind of nice you kind of have this really interesting uh, like uh, Tamagotchi dynamic with it that you got to keep it happy and feed it 
uh, but then it also levels and you can buy stuff for it and really really nice they, they found the middle of the road like nothing feels like too extreme it, it feels it feels like a really good clean game I'm, I'm excited I can't wait for it to ship I was gonna say if I if I want to play it now is there anything I can do you, you have to e email me and I'll email uh, the guys over at Spacetime okay. uh, Gary, Gary Hook our, our audience too should we tell everyone to email Colt I, I think you should email Spacetime Studios and say how excited you are about the game <laughs> okay. and maybe they'll put you on the beta uh, right. don't, don't hold me to that but yeah it's a great game um, I have had very little time to play games the last like couple weeks. It's uh, got my family in town now, and apparently I can't ignore them and go up into the <laughs> office and play games. So, uh, so a little bit of Skyrim because you know that's going to be my answer for the next year until I until I complete it. But uh, that's been it. Hmm. Hoping to hoping to get back into some more gaming in the next couple weeks. Uh, I'm I'm the same way. I've been I've been cranking on stuff, so I haven't had much chance to play play things. Uh, Still playing uh, Steambirds, um, got hmm. hooked on that, and now I'm hooked on getting all the stars. Because <laughs> mm. the thing with Steambirds is it's like, oh, you go in and you're like, oh, I got the bad guys, that's fine. It's like, no stars, keep your planes healthier. And you're like, okay. <laughs> and then you go back <laughs> and then you're like, oh, I almost got it. Okay, I understand now. And I began seeing how the game fit together. And I was like, mm. oh, actually, this is very clever. I got, I, got, I, I, I got hooked on it, but honestly, not much gaming. And what yeah, system okay. is that on? Too much building. What is that on? Uh, I'm playing it on my Nexus 7. Sweet. Uh, you, okay. can, you can get it on Android. I think you can look for it on the web. But honestly, the Nexus 7 experience has been, again, I, you know, I go and I get a sandwich and I'm sitting in the cafe and like dripping barbecue sauce on my Nexus oh, 7. Oh, these, these, these are these are Barbecue sauce proof. It you is can actually <laughs> put it in at 100 meters of barbecue sauce. True. We tried it. I was say, and um, it still works. We'll have the video next episode. Yeah, yeah no, ne the Nexus 7 has been a really fun gaming device for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I see you're checking out Steambirds there. You're like, I was. I was <laughs> like, let like, me see oh, what's available really? on. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think you and I clearly need to play more games. I'm going to play some games this weekend, and it's I will get back It's sort of embarrassing that we're in the Google Games chat. Well, yeah. we'll shift. Panel. We'll shift. Uh, you guys have been working, so you'll play games for the next two weeks, and we'll actually do work. Yep. And then and shift then. again. All it's right. just the ebb and flow. It's like, it's like job sharing. <laughs> yeah. We're Put outsourcing the gameplay. Put that on my goals for the quarter. Play more games. All right. Well, I think that is it. We're just about out of time. Um, we'd like to thank everybody for joining us yes. and like uh, asking love questions. We love having questions. That was nice. Jimmy. It big, was like big, we had a little conversation with you. Big you round of applause yeah, for I Jimmy. Everybody, give it up for Jimmy. Yay, thank you, Jimmy. 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 And uh, and is is Jimmy going to fade us out? All right, Jimmy's going to fade us out. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks.